We're here with Norman Halliday this morning at the McMichael Canadian Art Collection in Vaughan, Ontario. Norman has been presenting his performances this weekend in celebration of his 50 years of work in Nunavut, studying Inuit elders and their relationship to the land. He first went to the Arctic when he was 16 years old as a survey crew member, although he knew nothing about surveying at that time, and he has been going back to the Arctic ever since. He has been a major contributor to knowledge of Inuit culture. He majored in industrial design and then did graduate work in Sweden, Italy, and Switzerland. He worked as a senior civil servant, both in the Department of Northern Affairs and with the Film Board of Canada. His contributions to the field of ethnography and ethnogeography are legend. When we first met at Duke University in 1999 at the celebration of the new territory of Nunavut, he presented a slideshow and talked about the language that was associated with the land. And it was evident at that time that you were looking at Inuit culture through the eyes of an artist and with artistic sensibility. I first wanted to ask you if that influenced the Inuit trust in you in terms of telling their stories, of showing you their sacred places, of, of uh, revealing their relationship to the land, and how, that, how your artistic sensibilities have influenced all of your studies and relationships. That's actually quite a uh, challenge because a, there's a complicated answer to your question. The, there were several things that allowed me to show the respect due to the elders and to gain their confidence that they could speak to me about things which were very personal to them. The first was that I never uh, interrogated the elders. I never posed questions to them. Because when you start to do that, you're actually invading another person's space. I was very careful to make known right at the beginning through just through gestures and through the words I was using that I didn't know anything. I couldn't survive in their country. I admired how they did that for 4,000 years. But I needed their help to understand a lot of things. I needed their help to understand what it was like to suffer real hardship. Um, what it was like to fear uh, spirits, malevolent spirits. All of these things here. And they would ask me, why do you want to know these things? And I would say there's two reasons. My family came from Central Europe. They came from a small village. They were very superstitious. They might go to church on Sunday but, and kiss the holy icon, but they would hang garlic in the doorways to ward off the werewolves thing, kind of thing. I talked to them about the starvation period that occurred in Central Europe. Um, I talked to him about my father being a serf, which meant a camp slave, which was the equivalent of a camp slave. And because he could own, serfs could never own their own land. They always had to give everything that they grew back to the, to the land uh, owner, etc. So what was, I was creating was this bridge between my culture, but my culture going back in time in Central Europe, uh, to some of the things that were occurring in their culture, and there was a similarity between the two. I can remember one elder saying, you don't look quite like a Harunach. Harunach is a white person. That literally means a person with bushy eyebrows. Uh, that's what it means. Because they think all white people have bushy eyebrows. And I, I sort of smiled a bit because 
I couldn't really explain to him that I had my DNA examined and my origins are Siberian, which is the same as theirs. Although I was a, a Khurunach, I was a, a, a Caucasian as opposed to more that occurred in Siberia. But what happened was that when I began to talk about my family and my experiences and my need to understand things, I was talking to people who were 10, 15, 20 years older than I, and the relationship was as if this was a kind of strange grandson who had been living somewhere else in the world asking them questions. And they were very forthcoming in talking to me about it because they did not have the opportunity to talk to their own children about it. One may ask why. Why didn't they pass this knowledge on to their kids? Well, in some cases their kids didn't want to know about it. In other cases, they were told, they being the elders and the kids, uh, by some religious leaders, that the old beliefs were not, they were not good because they sometimes uh, conjured up the devil that was related to shamanism. And it was really suppressed. And it was almost shameful to be talking about the old ways when you were a kid at school learning Dick and Jane and uh, later on uh, hoping to be able to drive a uh, dump truck or something. So there was a real schism that took place and especially reinforced when they went to school. They're not going to learn about shamans at school. They're not going to learn about how you live on the land at school. So that occurred. Now, all of a sudden here comes a white guy who's kind of curious, he's uh, sensitive, he's uh, inquiring about things, but there are things in his past that they could help him understand, and that was very crucial. I would, I would take up, for example, photographs of my family, my dog, uh, picnics we were on, I'd explain, that's my sister, and this is my mom and dad, etc. And I built up this, this uh, connection, really, uh, which is on the human plane. Yeah, I wasn't going up as a, as a scientist, as an archaeologist. As a matter of fact, it wasn't my intent to study their culture uh, or, or, or how they lived at all. I was just curious about what life was like up there and what I could learn from the lessons that they could teach me. Uh, because it was a very unique experience. I think art had something quite a bit to do with it, although not in the conventional way. I wasn't really interested in quote unquote their art. Um, but the training I had at school uh, in design and industrial design and in, in art in general was based on the fact that you looked at rather ordinary things and you attempted to study them in a way that looked beyond the surface of that thing, whether it was, whether it was a, uh, a tree, a flower, whatever. And you were trying to examine what was the most important essence of that thing. So you were actually changing the model, the framework, if you like, uh, by looking at the things around you. And we did that very consciously. I remember having the, the uh, assignment of looking at a Greek vase, which is a beautiful, beautiful symmetrical object, as you know. And the challenge was, how could you describe that Greek vase in a way totally different to what you were seeing? That's a big challenge. I mean, it's so abstract, and, you know, where do you start? I decided I could look at it from a point of view of a mathematician, and I could break down its, its components in terms of the lines of that Greek vase, its curves, etc., uh, using geometry, which I did. Uh, I did this very complicated geometrical uh, conversion, if you like. But then to prove it, I built a box, a cardboard box, and I made little pinholes exactly where all these certain tangents had to be, and I strung them with white. Uh, silk thread. And the moment they were all strung together, there was the Greek vase uh, in terms of its shape, in terms of the space it occupied. Now that was very useful in terms of saying, what are the really important things? 
that I must listen to. First of all, the questions. Ask the wrong questions and you forget it. Uh, the, the first difficult thing to learn was how to pose the right question in such a way that it wasn't an invasion. I mean, if you went to a person and said, tell me about shamanism, it's really out of the place. Because that's not your, it's none of your business. But if you were to say to them, can, is there some way you can help me understand how my grandmother saved my life when I was a baby by giving my mother very certain instructions. And then you would repeat those instructions to them. And they might be amazed and say, that's exactly what we did. And immediately you cross that, that connection. Or the time I was, remember I was being uh, chastised quite severely by an elder I respected highly uh, when I started to ask about cannibalism. And he got really angry. He said, you know, you have no, no business asking us things like that. It's, ter it's terrible to ask. He, said, he was really quite angry. And he said, why do you ask such stupid things like that? And I said, they're not stupid. I said, my grandmother used to sing me a song. And I'll sing it to you. And I sang him the song in Russian, Nikolai Popolai, Zhidu Zhiku Zamalai, Adetan Zabat. And I had to explain to him the song was of a man who and his family who were starving. He sold his wife for some bread. He sold his children for some sacks to put that bread in. And he finally sold his daughter for an old donkey that he could ride to the next village and hopefully find some work and find some food. On the way, he was attacked by some very bad people. They killed him and there was nothing left. Not him, not his children, not his wife, nothing. And there were tears in his eyes. And he said, are you telling me that the Kalina were actually starving? I said, yes. And they had even, there were cases where they had even eaten each other. And, he, and it was actually, he, turned, he was one of the famous artists in Cape North. He was weeping. And he put his arms around me and gave me a big hug. And there was never any question after that. And they, I learned all kinds of things. Now mind you, I don't write about them. Uh, I think I touched on it a bit in my latest book uh, called An Intimate Landscape which is really a journal. Uh, because there's certain things that you don't have to write about, you shouldn't write about, because, you know, what's going to be gained by telling somebody outside in the outside world about some very dark, intimate thing that has happened? Uh, but that began to build up the trust. Now, there's another thing that's really important here to understand, is that if I'm talking, you're an elder and I'm talking to you, well, You've got the whole village who knows you, and they're going to say, "Well, what did you? How did that talk with the white guy? You know, how was it?" And you're going to say, "Oh, we had an interesting talk. We talked about." It. So, by and large, everybody knows what you've talked about in that village, and they know how you've how you've uh, acted in in uh, these conversations, and you learn that there is a protocol, if you like, and really a, a, a series of respectful actions uh, that you learn and very, it's very important and very, some, of them, some of them are very subtle. This is a problem you see with, with scientists that go up. They have an agenda, they have an assignment, and they have within that certain things they have to do within a certain uh, construct. Because you can't just write some notes on a piece of paper if you're a scientist and submit that to a jury. It has to be written in a very specific form, etc. So you actually create the model you use to interrogate or to investigate a given subject. I would argue that the creation of that model determines the outcome of that investigation of the subject to a large degree, or shapes it. I also am a, a strong believer in the what I call a Worfian hypothesis. Now Worf was an interesting guy who when he thought about language he finally came to one of the conclusions was that 
the language we use shapes the reality we see or know of. That's a pretty, a pretty acceptable kind of view, at least for me. But it was poo-pooed by the linguists. They said, no, 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 language, more far more coming in. But you see, that's because Worf was not a linguist. He was a chemist. But I think he had this, this wonderful insight into language. That's in Hayakawa, etc. And I always believe that, that, that the language that one uses can often, especially with, with talking with elders, can often shape the outcome. The elder is pondering, well, he's asking me about this, or she's asking me about this. I wonder if they want to hear this answer, and they will construct the answer that they think you want to hear, which means you've lost, you've lost the line of inquiry, you know? So I was very careful on how I spoke uh, actually to my interpreter. Now, that was a whole other thing, is that there were a lot of things I could get along with fine on my own, but with the elders, a lot of them spoke a language that I had spoken today, or there were words that I used. Um, and it was really important to have an interpreter with you who fully understood what you were about, who you were, your nature, whether you were grumpy that day, it, it, was a, it was a kind of an intimate relationship you had with your interpreter. And that interpreter got to know even how your brain works. Sometimes you might stumble and say, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm thinking about, and they'd say to the elder, he really wants to know about how you kill a seal in the summertime. Uh, you wouldn't even have to ask the question, they wouldn't know that. And because I only had, I think, about five interpreters for over a period of 50 years. Uh, and what we would do is that, this was a very basic thing, I would talk to the interpreter, first of all, first of all I would go to the elder and I'd say, look, I really would like to learn from you uh, about life in the old days, when you lived in the camp, that would be pretty sick. Uh, you want, would you talk to me about that? so that, you know, I could understand how it was every day, what the things you did. And in all probability, they'd say, sure, I'll do that, fine. I said, well, I'll bring some tea, I'll bring, you like tea, okay. I'll bring some chili con carne, they love chili con carne. Uh, and cheese, love cheese, okay. So I said, we'll have lunch, but I'm not gonna ask you questions and answers, I don't wanna do that. I'm gonna set up my camera, my video camera, and I want to talk to you just at the very beginning and say, when I put my hand up, that means the camera's going to go on. When I go like that, it means finish. I've got to do something with the camera. And I, go like, I understand all that. So I said, but I'm not going to ask you questions. I want you to talk. I will just listen. And my interpreter would sit there, and I would sit there, maybe for an hour. And they would, guy would be, Osho like Osho Ita, would be talking about this and talking about that, what not, and he created the whole narrative. It was his narrative, not mine, not, and I didn't shape it. I did this with every elder, you see, that was the beauty of it. Then at the end of it, uh, if my interpreter that day was Lithia, because he happened to like Lithia, uh, we'd go back to, the, back to my little tiny hovel, and I would put the tape on the, the TV set that was in there, and we'd go through the whole tape. And uh, she said, oh, now this, is, this part is really important because now he's talking about thoughts of uh, how people think about different things. Uh, I, would have, I, could, I would have missed that because, again, he was using old terms. In fact, I talked about them yesterday, uh, et etc. And we would verify what he had said, not word for word, it didn't have to be word for it. It had to be, what was he saying in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, if you like, the whole narrative. Then we would go back, maybe the next day, maybe two or three days later, back to Oshu, and we said, look, um, we're going to tell you, repeat to you the story you gave to us. And we would repeat it back to him. 
And he said, yeah, that's, that's the, well, wait a minute, no, no, that part there where I was talking about, I know I said that, but I really didn't mean that. So that's what we would correct. So it was a check that was really important. Plus the fact that they could see themselves on the screen. That was the beauty of it all. Now in the early days, the really early days, I had to do it in writing. So we would have to do the narration back to them. Uh, but uh, I was amazed that 90, you know, 95% of the time, they were totally in agreement with what had been documented. Now that began to build up a, another level of trust in that the elders would spread the word around that they were involved in something important and that was saving that this Khrunach, uh, actually they began to give me a nickname called Gapersukti, which means the, inquis the inquisitive one. The inquisitive one is taking our thoughts down uh, so that later on they won't be lost. And that, was, that became very important, that they would, their thoughts would not be lost. As a matter of fact, at one, at one point, Oshui took says, the things that you are writing down must be written down very carefully because you're writing down our thoughts and those thoughts would eventually uh, be looked at by our great-grandchildren. It was an admonition. It wasn't saying, oh, you're doing a wonderful job. It was saying, be careful, kind of thing. But it was saying it with respect and that he knew that this, this was important stuff. And they all knew. They all wanted to. I could talk to any elder in, in the community over it, but that was over time. At the beginning, it was, you know, who is this weird guy who's come up from the sofa asking these questions that nobody's ever asked before? So that's how the relationship grew. That's what caused me to document a way of life that is now gone to capture words, thoughts, and images that no longer exist. And I wasn't doing it for any scientific purpose. I was doing it for the sheer joy and curiosity of learning about these things. And through that, I was hopefully beginning to learn things about myself. You know, we may think we know a lot about ourselves. It's not necessarily so. Uh, but it began to change my outlook, and I've spoken during some of my lectures about this. My outlook in the world around me, and asking, you know, ask very simple questions like, what is the what is the purpose of my life? What is what is the most important thing today? Or is that tree important? But what is the importance of importance? You know, you were getting as Osho had said. Never mind the outside of the thing. You have to go inside. You have to understand what's what the real inside of the thing is, and that's what I was learning from from old guys like him, old guys like not only Oshuita, Osuchiak and Simeoni. Now, most of the stuff I've talked about is dealing with the the spiritual aspects. People have asked me, you know, are you a, a spiritual person or a religious person, and I keep saying, no, I'm not. Uh, you know, it's, I'm a very curious person. And they would wonder, well, why was I pursuing the spiritual aspect? And I would think about that and I would say, look, there were some people who lived in a certain place at a certain time who believed everything around them was inhabited by spirits. Now, if you believe that, your whole, con your whole conduct throughout life is determined by that belief. And you, you be begin to behave in a very different manner than a person living in the jungles of, or, or not in the jungle, a person living in Manhattan would think. You know? And so the spiritual thing uh, became very important to at least understand it a little. Uh, because I don't understand it fully. I don't, I don't go out and kiss and love trees, but I do respect trees in, in the only way in which I know how. So this thing about the spiritual side uh, has been a journey that continues to go on, and 
in some ways it's kind of satisfying because at least you're on a trail. You're not just wandering through some wasteland. There's a trail you can, that you don't know where it's going to lead to, but it's, it's going ahead. And then you become involved in some quite intimate things. Like I said to, I think it was Cindy Haney, I said, okay, uncle, did I call him uncle? Yeah, I called him uncle. I said, what is a human being? That's a pretty profound question. What is a human being? I challenge you, give me a good answer. And he said, human beings five things. And I thought, well, that's going to be interesting. Human being is a name. You can't be a human without a name. You have to have a name. Human being is a body. You have to have a body to be a human being. And he gave me, this was all done in the book, Timia. Ati was the name, Timia. You have to have a spirit. This is where it gets kind of tricky. Uh, because it's important, if you don't have a spirit, you have no strength, you can't do anything. You have to have that spirit. He said, then you have to have Inua. It's life force. And then you have to have Anusia. And Anusia is that which makes you a human and not a caribou and not a polar bear and not a fish and makes a fish, not a seal and so forth. This is so bloody profound, I can't get my head around. But he's, he's describing something that is in, in a way simple and yet very complex. And I remember talking on the ship when I gave a lecture to Dr. David Suzuki, one of the great geneticists of our time. And we were talking about the inner one, he was interested in it. And I told him about this body thing. Now when I got to the Anusia, he couldn't believe what he had heard. And he said, they're talking about the genetic code. He says, that's what it was. And he, he, he said, you know, this is the beauty of getting into that kind of level of listening, and not conversating. I didn't, I just asked him a simple question, what's a human being? And I got this incredible insight from his point of view. And I perfectly accept that. So then that led me to even a more profound, even a more abstract question, at which I was almost afraid to ask. I said, okay, uncle, now tell me, explain to me what happens to us when we die. He was a catechist. He went to church on Sundays. He knew about heaven and Jesus and all this kind of stuff. He said, do you remember I told you about uh, the Inua, the life force? It just goes on. And they go on. To... And he wasn't talking about uh, reincarnation. He was talking about the life force. Everything, everything alive has the same energy. Whether it's a blade of grass that feeds the caribou, that, is, that feeds the hunter, that feeds the entire village. It all has that one magical thing, and that's the life force. And it does not die. It goes on and on and on and on. It can, and if you kill it, if you kill that animal, the life force leaves it. If you can't kill the life force. And I thought, oh. you know, all the stuff I'm starting to learn from these, from these people, was a wonderful and incredible uh, adventure into the same world I'm living in, but a whole different dimension of it. I remember sitting up at Kate Dorset overlooking Whaler's Cove, and I asked you, what do you think happens to us when we die? And you simply moved your hand out over the ocean and the cove and just said this, which is the life force. Yeah, I don't even remember that. That's that's quite uh, that's quite a nice uh, way to, to look at it. But that see again uh, another way of look. These things connect together like that. Did, that does with what he was talking about, life force. But you just caused me to remember with Simeone. Uh, no, it was with Oshita. We're going down uh, along the coast to Tiliartuk, uh, where he used to live, and 
I asked him some abstract question like, you know, where, where do we fit in all these things, uh, into the world and all these things? I mean, that's a heck of an abstract. You can't even ask a, uh, you know, a, a, a really high-powered professor and get a decent answer on that. And he said, see that Anukshuk over there? I said, yeah. See those hills? The, one, the ones there, it looks like a woman's breast. I said, yeah, I see that. See the ocean around here? I said, yeah. He said, we're all made of the same thing. I thought about that and I said, you know, if you break it down to the atomic size, that's true. Now, how the hell do they know these things? But again, that was connected to the business of the life force. We're all made of the same thing, and the thing that separates some uh, do not have a life force, but most do. But the one thing that became very apparent, that at one time, everything had spirits. And they all mix up the spirit with the soul or the life force. They're very different things. So, uh, it was, it was, these lines of, of pursuit and asking the right questions and it didn't it didn't matter how profound they were they may they could these elders thought very deeply of things when they were out on the land and what still puzzles me is that behind it there's a backdrop of what we would call violence now that i could never understand is that how does violence fit into our lives and is it an essential part of our lives? It seems to be. You know, from what we what we see, violence in its many forms. But I never did get into the, the, the talking of violence except on a very superficial level. Um, so I spent almost fifty years, not I say say full years, because I would go up to the Arctic uh, often in the summer gone up in the winter, gone up in the spring. But the reason I would prefer to go up in summer is you could travel on the land. And it was traveling on the land that was really important to me. Um, so that I could see the landscape from a geographer's point of view and from a geologist's point of view, because I did study some geology. Uh, but I could also see what I was really looking for was traces of human habitation and movement. Because that intrigued me. Where did the human travel on this landscape? Why did the human go from here to there? When they, why did they make their abode over here? There are, these are a whole series of questions that their relationship to the landscape. They knew the landscape, they knew where the spirits were, they knew all of this. What was, how could you trace their pattern of movement and what did it tell you? And believe it or not, I, I, I found a lot of this stuff up and I mapped uh, all of Southwest Baffin Island from a, uh, really from an eth ethnographic point of view. It's a very short report, but it's very thorough. The, uh, the only thing I left out were, were the uh, very important religious, what we would call religious sites where I did I felt it. I can't do that. I can't put them down there and have some twit going up there digging it up and trying to find something. Because I strongly oppose the, the disturbance of sites. I really dislike that when I see a site torn all up to hell. And you say, you know, it was a, this is a totally site. I mean, why was it all disturbed when there have been hundreds of Thule sites disturbed? I mean, surely God would know about Thule sites by now. Surely we know that the Inuit are amongst the most studied people on earth. They are. In fact, they resent uh, when they often will resent scientists coming up and then questioning them in a, you know, in a very precise manner. But they also would never disturb their sites. No. No. no it's beginning to change now, unfortunately. It's just starting to when one of the most famous sites of all is the one I documented. Actually, I've documented it several times over the years. A place called Anukshari. Uh, <clears throat> and that's where there are at least 100 standing Anukshari uh, with stone figures. Uh, I was told, as 
matter of fact, a few days ago, when I met one of the Inuit elders who came down for some heart work, or sorry, it was uh, knee surgery. And she, we were talking about places we had traveled to, and she said, you know, if you went back, you would be very sad because you know, some of those looks she had been torn apart. And I said, well, who would do that? She said, some of the young guys would do that to make hunting blinds where they would shoot geese. And I said, that would have never been done, never, ever. No one would ever touch an enough truck in the days when I was up there. I said, uh, you should, you elders should get on the radio, get out of, get off your stools there, get on the radio and tell the young people that they can't do this, it's forbidden. But they won't do it because the young people don't care. They wouldn't listen to them. And I said, well, at least tell them that it's bad luck and it will it'll cause great harm to them, scare them and so on. She said, well, it already did to one of them. He uh, was murdered by his girlfriend kind of thing. But it's a sad thing because some young Inuit and some young organized Inuit organizations are trying very hard not to preserve but to conserve some of the traditional aspects of Inuit life, and they're very proud of it. But on the other hand, you'll have another group who say, ah, it doesn't mean it. You know, I gotta drive a truck, I gotta make money, you know, that little turnip the size of, of, of an orange costs three dollars. You know, a turkey is about a hundred dollars for a turkey. I mean, I'm not gonna, I don't worry about this, this kind of stuff. Forget it, that's the old way, you know. And, there is that conflicting attitude that can occur in some communities. Others are are still pretty, uh, you know, they still are very respectful of the path. It seems that the more isolated the community is, the, the better off they are. Uh, I've been to a few very isolated communities, and I was surprised that the a lot of the old belief systems still exist there, although they're not displayed openly to the Kharuna. One thing that's curious I, I should touch on too is that in carefully gathering information, it's like it's like it's like acquiring money. It becomes a currency because you've got information on this and that, and whatnot, and you can go into another community and say, you know, Grandma, my grandma in King Night Cape Dorset was talking to me about little doll-like figures they used to make that had a kind of power to them. But I couldn't really understand her. Uh, she, 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 didn't, she wasn't that clear when she was explaining that to me. Did your people ever do things like that? And she might say, yeah. I said, well, can you help me? And she'd say, sure. And she would, or yes, and she would talk to you about that. Or you might say, uh, in Kenai, I came across this beautiful sugar, and I was, I really liked and I photographed it, and now it's now in a big exhibition down south. And they said, well, what's a sugar? I said, you know, when it rains, after it rains, you see these colors in the sky. Well, you mean a kata? I said, well, is that what you call it? Yeah, it's a kata. Oh, no, sorry, a kataya. Oh, okay, Katalia, Katalia, Kata, Kao, Ka. So it must have also the meaning that it's an entrance, besides being an arch kind of thing. But you could tr you could build up currency in another in another village by explaining some of the things you learned in the past village kind of thing, and it would accumulate to a point where I was asked. It was last year to go up to a very remote place. There was a meeting of uh, people who were on this very important committee called NERV, Nunavut Impact Review Board, who had total, absolute power to reject or accept any project in the in the Nunavut. I mean, they were very. They were probably the most powerful committee of all. They had one problem. In terms of the criteria 
in making a decision whether accepting or rejecting, it was, it was always based on a series of questions. The one thing they couldn't deal with is what is you know, the, the intellectual culture and what is the material culture. It doesn't make any sense to them. But they had to be sure to check off does this impact the material culture or the intellectual culture? They couldn't check it in one way. So this consultant actually, from the set of a very good consultant, he spent a long time up near it, was asked to go up and talk about how to reorganize certain aspects of the committee and all this kind of stuff. But even he couldn't deal with it, with that very, and it became a very important and central question. So one of his assistants says, there's this guy called Hallandy. He's People say that he's a real expert in all this strange stuff. So they said, would I come up? They subcontracted to me to make a presentation to all the people on the committee. And they were all in it. There's no, not a single white person on the committee. About what is the material culture and what is the intellectual culture. A white guy was going to have to explain to them these things. So what I did is rather than explain to him, because the language is visual, when you stop to think about it, I thought the best way to explain it is not through just simply through words, white man's words, it would have to be translated as best as they could into an octeto. Well, why don't I just show them examples? So I presented them with a, uh, a, well, a slideshow type thing. I hate the word slideshow, but I presented them with a series of images, and the presentation lasted about three quarters of an hour. I would show them, for example, some of the images are right here. I would show them two upright stones. I said, okay, these are two upright stones, but they're not ordinary stones. These stones make a katah. A katah is the entrance. Now, because you have an entrance, the entrance has to lead you somewhere. And the entrance has a pathway going through it. And it would actually, and I would bring up on, through, through some work on, on the computer, I'd bring up the pathway that they could see. And that pathway leads you to another stone way off there. And that stone is a tunilarvik, where you make offerings. The katak, the two upright stones, and the stones at the back, part of your material culture. You put them there. You knew that they should be put there. You knew why they should be put there. But they're stones. That's part of your material culture. But to know about the pathway, to know the incantations you have to take, to know that you have to give gifts to that stone at the end, that's your intellectual culture. The lights started to go on. And then I took them through all kinds of other examples what is the material and what is the intellectual. And the intellectual, of course, captures all the spiritual stuff, captures the legends. Uh, and, you know, I could talk to them about sites that there was a legend here, where there giants live, etc. See the, see all those stones there? They make a big circle. Now the stones themselves are part of your material culture. You put them there. Your ancestors put them there. But they make that circle. And in that circle, it's very powerful. Ordinary people can't go in there. And I think I showed that in one of those examples yesterday. But that's part of your intellectual culture. Then the stories about the giants who lived there, that's part of your intellectual culture. It's what goes on in your head. It's the sumatuli. They were ecstatic. See, these guys were roughly the age of, say, 50. Maybe the oldest guy was 60. Well, I was 80. You know, I'm a whole generation older than the oldest guy there. And they were amazed at the information. And I had to explain to them, it doesn't come from me. It, all I am is I'm, the, I'm like the ghostwriter of the old people. Because I just wrote down and took on film and took on videotape what they told me. So what I'm giving to you is what they gave me, so I feel good giving it back to you again. And again, it was so, so incredible. That you know, normally you would get a little note back, usually written by 
some assistant in the office says, Dear Mr. Hallanday, uh, Lucas City wants to thank you very much for the important contribution that you made to our meeting in Iglulik concerning uh, the issues of determining what is the intellectual and uh, the material culture. Uh, yours truly, we hope that we can keep in touch in the future sometime. Lucas is signed by Lucas. That wasn't what I got. What I got was, you have taught me who I am. Lucas, that's all it said. Powerful. You have taught me who I am. That's so bloody powerful. I thought I could never think of anything like that. So it's it's this wonderful experience you have in giving you whole different perspectives on things that you thought you knew all about. It, in, in other words, how do you look at the world around you in a totally different way? What is really important in one's life? Uh, what is important to the things that are happening right now? What is important to this, the span of time that you've got left? And this doesn't mean you have to get all kinds of, of uh, you know, strange esoteric uh, beliefs and whatnot. It's simply really clarifying your mind and saying, wait a minute, there's a lot of stuff I don't know about. How can I, how can I better understand them? And it might take an old person, it might take a kid, who knows, you know. But the mind must keep open. Uh, I think one of the greatest gifts you can, you can have is the curiosity of a child. Childhood is so bloody wonderful. It's, it's when you discover the world and when you are at the center of that world and we lose it through this normal process of being educated, growing up and paying taxes and it's all, all this other stuff. But how, do you, how can you go back for at least a period of time? It's the question that I'm always asked except, except yesterday was, uh, why do you go up north? Why would you go up north? You know, it's cold, it's mean, it's miserable. And my answer is a very simple answer. Well, it's simple in a way. And that is that the reason I go there is that from time to time, when I'm in the North, I become the person I would really like to be. Because I'm not that person. <laughs> but I have an idea of what I'd like to be. And you just get on the edges of that when you're up there. When you're lying on a rock overlooking the sea with an old hunting companion and there's a thousand sea pigeons down there and they're all chirping you know and you think you're in heaven whatever heaven is paradise heaven whatever and the both of you don't even speak to one another and the both of you are smiling like a cheshire cat in it it's so bloody wonderful or you're at the tidiadjuk at the narrows and you're seeing these huge icebergs just moving across there driven by currents and driven by the wind. You see this incredible power just moving around it. And it's so joyful. It doesn't matter if you're 50, 20, 100 years old. It's, it's, it becomes an, an essential thing in the real word of the word essence, you know, to experience these things. So, that's, uh, I keep thinking with some measure of sadness that my trips to the Arctic uh, have really come to an end. Uh, the old people are dead. All, of, all the elders I knew are gone. And with them are gone the stories, the experiences, and countless other things I could have learned. Young people are, are different. They're, they show me measure of respect because of my relationship with their fathers and grandfathers and mothers, etc. But it's not the same. It's not the same. The only thing that is the same is that when you're alone and you go out on the land, you still can connect with, if you like, the spiritual forces of that landscape. That never changes. Even today, young people say they want to go out on the land, but that means they just want to get away from town, you know, get away from people knocking on your door or whatever, go and get
get refreshed for a weekend at camp kind of thing. But it's like us going to the cottage now. It's not the same as it was before. But fortunately, um, it was a very melancholy experience. So I just finished my third book called uh, An Intimate Landscape. Because I'm, ta I'm really talking about people as being part of that landscape also. Um, it's a journal talking about the important things that happened in my life up there uh, with the elders uh, and how it affected me. Now, I'll probably self-publish it, uh, notwithstanding my other two books are, are still doing very well. The first one is was a bestseller years ago, the book on the nuptial which is sold all over the world now. Uh, people have bought the thing in Switzerland, where it's, uh, it's done amazingly well. Uh, second book is now starting to catch up with the first book. The third book is going to be very different. It's very personal. Um, I talk about things I've never talked about before. I talk about when my life was threatened. Because it wasn't all roses. You know, there were some pretty tough times that happened there. Uh, but I decided that I'll scrape together money from my pension and whatever else I can uh, do, speaking tours maybe, and publish it myself, publish probably only a thousand copies, uh, hardcover, they'll be signed and numbered, and uh, make sure that any serious institution of learning with regard to the Arctic gets one, one way or the other, and that will be it, and at least it will be preserved. See, I was terrified that all the stuff I collected would eventually sort of fall apart. My daughters would say, oh, we don't need, to. what's all these crazy notes that my dad made, you know, get rid of that, and so forth. That can often happen. But I had a meeting right here at McMichael. Uh, last yesterday and it's pretty well concluded that all my archives everything in it my 52 hours of videotapes my extensive book collection my extensive map collection maps of the entire Arctic etc uh, handwritten notes my morgue of, filled with clippings of anything to do with the with the Arctic or its people etc everything that I have uh, is going to be donated to this place. Because I've already donated seven and a half thousand images here. So eventually there'll be this massive Hell in the Archives established here at McMichael and the stuff will be kept all together. Because I, I had uh, the opportunity to donate the stuff in pieces to various institutions. For example, uh, the Smithsonian, of which I'm a research associate of. Museum of, uh, I think it's Museum of History now, they keep changing their name. It's the Museum of History wanted the stuff. The National Gallery of Canada, of course, wanted anything related to art, but I didn't want to break it up. Because all the stuff that I collected, as disparate as the pieces are, uh, are part of the collection. And what they're describing is a point in time. They're describing that point in time when the elders came off the land where they lived for practically all of their lives and moved into settlements and how their lives were changing. That's what this captures. It captures that incredibly important uh, period. Uh, and not, not through the eyes of a Haruna, of a white man or a scientist, right? but through their eyes where the white man, the Haruna, has simply been the ghost writer. So that's it.